Hi, welcome back. To this is my third data update for 2023. Now, in my last update, I talked about how 2022 was an unsettling year for equity investors. It was an unsettling year for equity investors. It was even more so for people who invested in bonds. In this session, I'm going to focus on U.S. bonds, both Treasury bonds and corporate bonds. And in both markets, you saw the effects of 2022. In the U.S. Treasury market, you saw rates rise, and I'm going to show you the effects it had on returns on long-term U.S. T-bonds. And in the corporate bond market, in addition to the increase in rates, you had an increase in default spreads. In fact, that increase in default spreads is part of a larger story of how the price of risk went up in both the equity markets. You saw, saw that with the equity risk premium in equity markets and with default spreads in bond markets. With no further ado, let's, think of, let's talk about what happened to bonds in 2022. I remember in my first finance class, I was told, you know, you buy T-bonds or T-bills for safety. And the implicit assumption was that U.S. Treasuries don't default. Let's hold on to that assumption. And let's talk about where the risk in these markets comes from for investors. In this graph, I've listed out what happened to Treasury rates from both the short end of the spectrum, with three-month rates, all the way to 30-year rates. Across the board, you saw rates go up in 2022. The three-month rate started the year at close to zero, ended the year at almost 4.36%. And the 10-year rate started the year at about 1.5%, ended the year at about 3.88%. So across the board, you saw rates go up, more so at the short end of the spectrum than at the long end. Now, of course, that the effect of that, you know, and this is pretty obvious, but might as well state, is the term structure became downward sloping. I'm not going to go there because there are people who build big stories about how do downward sloping yield curves always predict recessions that might or might not be true. I'm going to focus on what these changing rates did to investors in U.S. Treasuries. Let's focus in on a 10-year T-bond. At the start of the year, the coupon rate, the interest rate in a 10-year T-bond is 1.51%. Let's suppose you bought a just-issued T-bond at the start of the year, where the coupon rate was set equal to the market interest rate. You'd have bought it at par, basically $1,000. You hold on to the bond at the end of the year, and I'm going to play a little trick here. Usually a 10-year bond becomes a 9-year bond. Let's assume that you were looking at a constant maturity bond, where the bond maturity stays 10 years. The coupon rate is stuck at 1.51%, right? But the market interest rate at the end of the year was 3.88%. Now, if you take that T-bond, that, that and you reprice it using a 3.88% interest rate. And what does repricing mean? You take the coupons of $15.10, 1.51% of the $1,000 each year, present value of that coupon for 10 years, and you take the present value of the $1,000 you're going to get at the end of year 10, the present value you get is about $807. In other words, you invested $1,000 at the start of the year. By the end of the year, that bond was worth only $807. That's a 19.3% loss, a negative return of 19.3%, or at least in terms of the price change. Now, you know, the price change is coming entirely from the fact that rates have gone up significantly over the course of the year. Now, incidentally, if you want to use a nine-year bond because you think that's more common sense, you'd still lose money. You'd lose about 18% of 19.3%. But to keep things consistent, I'm going to stay with these constant maturity bonds. So on the price change front, you'd have lost 19.3%. You would have collected your coupon of 1.51%, which would have given you a return for the year of minus 17.83%. Think about it. You bought T-bonds thinking they were safe, and you actually lost 17.8% of your money. In fact, that return is very close to what equities lost, minus 18% during the course of the year. T-bonds had a, a, almost as bad a year as stocks did. In, in real terms, the damage was even worse. Because if you could make a nominal return of minus 17.8% in a year where inflation was 6.42%, the real return on T-bonds was close to minus 23%. It was a terrible year to be holding long-term bonds. And if you had bought a 30-year bond, the damage would have been even greater because of the longer maturity. Now, with that return in mind, let's think about, how, now, let's put it in historical context. I have data going back to 1928, and I've computed the returns on T-bonds, just like I did in 2022. I computed the returns in 2021 and 2020, etc., going all the way back to 1928. Take a look at how bad 2022 was. 
it was the worst year in at least my recorded history for an investor in a 10-year T-bond. Minus 17.8% and minus 22.79% in real terms, the worst that you've had over the 95-year period. If it was a bad year for stocks, it was the worst ever year for T-bonds. Now, to talk a little bit about how unusual 2022 was, I'm actually going to bring in the equity return into the picture as well. If you look across the entire 95-year time period, if you remember, we had 26 years out of those 95 where stock returns were negative. Yet 19 years over that period where bond returns were negative. There have been only five years in that 95-year history where both stock returns and bond returns were both negative. And there's never been a year until 2022 where both were not just negative, but worse than minus 10%. So the co-movement that you've seen between stocks and bonds usually means that when stocks do bad, well, bonds do badly. That's, you know, that, 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 that co-movement historically has been pretty weak. You can see it with the correlation from, in, the, between stocks and bonds over the period, 0.024. But in 2022, we had both those asset classes move in not just in the same direction, but badly in the same direction. Now, of course, if you ask people, why did rates rise in 2022? The answer you almost always get, and this is something that I think has happened since 2008. The answer you get is the Fed did it. Really? The Fed was why rates went up in 2022? To Address that question. This is something I've been doing for a while now because I want to push back against this notion that the Fed has been responsible for keeping rates where they are. Is I've constructed what I call an intrinsic risk-free rate. What do I do? What do I do? I take the inflation rate each year and the real growth rate each year. So that's what the graph shows you. The red number is the inflation rate. The gray, green is the real growth rate. Add them up. And what I get is an intrinsic risk-free rate. So if my inflation is 2%, my real growth is 3%. 2 plus 3 is 5%. So why are you doing this? Take a look at the history of that intrinsic risk-free rate and compare it to what the T-bond rate, the black line, did over the period. And most of the time, they move together, right? In fact, if you ask me why were interest rates low over the last decade, I'm not going to tell you it's the Fed that did it with quantitative easing. It was really because inflation was low and real growth was anemic. Low plus low is low. I'm not I'm a realist. I know the Fed can affect rates at the margin, but they affect rates at the margin. In fact, I would argue that in 2022, rates would have gone up strongly with or without the Fed. And the reason is inflation jumped during the course of the year. Now, if you still hold on to this notion that it is the Fed that's, that's pushing up rates, let me show you a couple of graphs. One actually looks at the market expectation of inflation. What's the market expectation of inflation instead of listening to economists tell you what inflation is going to be or surveys tell you what inflation is going to be? I compare two rates, the 10-year T-bond rate to the TIPS rate. The TIPS is, of course, a treasury bond where you get a real interest rate. You compare those two rates, you're getting a measure of expected inflation. Through 2022, that number was between 2 and 2.5%. Two and two and to give, In fact, it got as high as 3% to, towards April of the year. But to give you some perspective, this would number, this expected inflation number, if you go back over the last decade, has between, been between 1 and 1.5%. One and the market is building in a much higher expectation of inflation going forward. Now, if you still want to hold on to the belief that it was the Fed that raised rates, I would remind you that the only rate that the Fed directly controls is the Fed funds rate. In this graph, I have the T-bond rate, the T-bill rate and the Fed funds rate over the course of 2022. Now, you can be the judge of this, but take a look at whether T-bill rates are going up because the Fed funds rate is increasing or whether the Fed funds rate is jumping to keep up with the T-bill rate. I might be blind, but to me, it looks like the Fed is chasing the market rather than the other way around. I mean, I'm, I'd suggest a little thought experiment. What if the Fed did not exist? What do you think rates would have done in 2022? I will wager that rates would have gone up in 2022 with or without the Fed. Now, of course, that's controversial. You can disagree with me. But I think the evidence is pretty clear that the Fed is a follower, not the leader when it comes to rate. I think this Fed fixation is a little unhealthy. And for the last decade, we've kind of attributed to the Fed powers it does not have. 
the Fed doesn't set rates. It doesn't set the Treasury rates. It doesn't set your mortgage rate. It does affect rates through the Fed funds rate. But I do think that fixation is unhealthy for a couple of reasons. One is it stopped us from thinking about the fundamentals that drive rates, inflation and real growth. And it's given active investors an excuse, right, for underperformance. Why did you underperform? Because the Fed was setting rates. And I think 2022, like in, on many other dimensions, was a return to reality that the Fed can't control rates if inflation is out of control. Now, that's a Treasury bond story. Let's talk about corporate bonds. When the Treasury bond rates go up, the base interest rate increases. The tide that, you know, so when the tide, the tide goes up, all boats rise, all rates rise. But to get to a corporate bond rate, you take the T-bond rate and you add a default spread to it. And during 2022, default spreads increased across the board. In this graph, I've looked at default spreads on bonds in different ratings classes from AAA, safest, all the way to high yield bonds. Across the board, default spreads went up. But they went up more for the lowest rated bonds. So if there's a price for risk, it's going up by more for the riskiest classes. In fact, if you look at the B rated and the high yield bonds, the default spreads almost doubled. So if you start with the base rate that's gone up and on top of that you add a default spread that is also much higher, you can see why corporate bond rates went up by even more than T-bond rates. So again, let me use the same technique I used on a 10-year T-bond to compute what the returns would have been on a BAA rated corporate bond. Remember, this is an investment grade bond and we're often told this is a pretty safe bond. That might be true in terms of default risk, but let's think in terms of price risk. If you'd bought the bond at the start of the year, the interest rate on a BAA rated coupon bond at the start of 2022, if you take the risk-free rate with the T-bond rate of 1.51% and the default spread then of 1.2%, you get an interest rate of 2.71%. Let's say you bought a bond with a coupon rate set equal to the interest rate that interest rate would have jumped over the course of 2022 from 2.71% to 5.6%. Why? Because the T-bond rate went up to 3.88% and the default spread went up to 1.72%. You take the coupons and the face value, just like you did with the T-bond, and you discount them back. The price of the bond that you started the year at 1000 would have been down to 733 Over the course of the year, your price change would have been minus 26.7%. Well, it would have been partially compensated, very partially, by the coupon of 2.71%. But during the course of the year, your nominal return on a corporate bond was minus 23.99%. That was, too, the worst year in history in terms of nominal returns on an investment-grade bond. In real terms, it gets a lot worse, right? You take the 6.42% inflation rate, your real return in 2022 is minus 31.12%. If it's a bad year for T-bonds, it's an even year, worse year for corporate bonds. Now, if you bring together both the last session and this one, last session I talked about how cost of equity for US co for companies has gone up. and this one, I've talked about the cost of debt going up for companies. If you bring them together in the cost of capital, the consequences are pretty obvious. The cost of capital for companies has changed pretty dramatically over 2022. At the end of 2022, the median U.S. company had a cost of capital of about 9.6%, and the median global company had a cost of capital of 10.6%. You think, so what? At the start of 2022, take a look at those numbers. The median U.S. company had a cost of capital of 5.77%. You've gone from 5.77% at the start of the year to 9.6% by the end of the year. The median global company in dollar terms, when I saw its cost of capital went from, go from 6.33% to 10.6%. Costs of capital have gone up across the board for U.S. companies, for global companies around the world. Now, you might think like an investor and think about, hey, this affects me. But I want to trace through why this higher cost of capital affects companies. That's corporate finance. Now, when I look at companies, I look at three big decisions they have to make the investment decision, the financing decision, the dividend decision. The cost of capital is what I call the Swiss Army knife of finance. It shows up in every single decision. In the investment decision, it becomes the hurdle rate you decide, use to decide whether to take projects. That hurdle rate jumped a lot during 2022, right? Holding all its constant, you'd have, you'd have a much harder time finding good investments 
at the start of 2023 than at the start of 2022 because your hurdle rate's much higher. In the financing principle, the cost of capital comes back into play. It becomes the optimizing tool. The mix of debt and equity you pick will be the one that minimizes your hurdle rate. During 2022, both the cost of equity and the cost of debt went up. You're saying, how is that going to change the mix? It depends on which went up more. The equity risk premiums went up, the default spreads went up. Depending on which one went up more, it's going to have an effect on the mix of debt and equity at companies. And on dividend, the dividend principle basically says if you cannot find investments that make the hurdle rate, give more cash back to the owners. And guess what? With a 10.6% global hurdle rate instead of a 6.33%, Fewer projects are going to pass muster. You're going to have more cash to return. So what does this all mean? Well, if cost of capital is going to create, the changes in the cost of capital are going to create upheaval among investors. They're going to, it's going to create even more upheaval among businesses, how they pick projects, how they fund them, how much they return in dividends. Well, we'll see what 2023 delivers on that front. So to close this session, I'd like to talk a little bit about where interest rates might go in 2023. I'll make a confession. I'm terrible at forecasting rates. But at the same time, I don't trust any of the forecasts I get from macroeconomists on where rates are going. Because I think this year, the destination for rates is not going to be determined by what the Fed does, but what the fundamentals do. In fact, I'm going to use a framework I used for looking at what stocks might do in 2023. I said it depends a great deal on where inflation is going during the course of the year and how the economy does. So I've taken those same four scenarios. Now, four scenarios built around what inflation does, that it either subsides to pre-pandemic levels or it stays high. There's no recession or a steep recession. And these are four discrete scenarios in the world as a continuous place, but think of them as four, you know, four, four quadrants that you can look at in terms of rates and looked at the f and what might happen to rates under each one. If inflation subsides quickly and there's no recession, I think you're going to see T-bond rates go down no matter what the Fed does. And you're going to see default spreads decrease because people are less worried about default risk. If inflation subsides, but it does so because there's a steep recession, I think you're going to see T-bond rates drop again. But you're also going to see default rates rise, the default spreads rise because more companies are going to default and worries about default are going to climb. If inflation stays high and there's no recession, no matter what the Fed does, I think rates are going to go up. T-bond rates are going to go up. Default spreads might decrease because there's no recession, but the overall effect on corporate bond rates is kind of mixed because the, the base rate has gone up. If inflation stays high and there's a steep recession, then in our worst possible scenario, T-bond rates are going to stay high and default spreads are also going to increase you're going to see a repeat in 2023 of what you saw in 2020, but 2022, but you're incre you, those increases will be on top of much higher rates than what we saw in 2022. Now, my suggestion, though, is no matter which of these scenarios are going to unfold, think about fundamentals. Worry less about Federal Open Market Committee meetings and what the Fed might do. Worry more about inflation and the real growth. When I say worry, I'm not saying lie awake at night thinking about these, but those should be what you think about when you think about interest rates and investing. I hope you found the session useful, and thank you very much for listening.